Judaism has been described by some as the world's strangest religion. What aspects of the Jewish religion are there that are valid and which ones are not? So let's understand, Christianity is a distinct and separate religion. It is not a form of Judaism. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto, the, unto him, How hast how hast answered right this do and thou shalt live but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus and who is my neighbor and Jesus answering said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed leaving him half dead now note, there is three different responses to this fellow's need. Starting in verse 31. And, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came, looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which, now of these three, thinkest thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. I want to thank Eric for reading that particular passage. It's a, um, it's a part of what I want to talk about today, and it illustrates some important things. Um, kind of a tough subject, but a situation that affects a lot of our people, um, especially since what happened 20 years ago in the Church of God. And I thought it would be important to to look at it carefully because it affects a lot of us. There is an idea out there where people expect that to embrace certain aspects of the Jewish religion will draw them closer to God. And you can understand why people would tend to think that because after all, isn't the Jewish religion the religion of the Old Testament? Well, that's the question. Is the Judaism, particularly the Judaism of today, the religion of the Old Testament? The early regard for the ministry of Jesus Christ and his followers, it was regarded as a sect 
of the Jewish belief system. And we can read of that in Acts chapter 28, verse 22. It says here, but we desire to hear of you what you think. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So this new theology, if we could call it that, that Jesus Christ was promoting was considered a sect of Judaism. But it was everywhere spoken against. Well, spoken against by whom? That's a key question. We've heard of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And that is sort of alleging that there is a continuity of belief or a similarity of belief between the two religions. That may be true so long as we think of ethics. But if we're thinking of teachings, that's a different matter entirely. There's a common misperception that Christianity evolved from Judaism. It's alleged that we have Jewish roots. That our religious culture grew out of Judaism. Is that really true? What was the soil where our roots grew? Because Christianity has roots, it certainly does. And it had an environment in which it could grow. But what was that environment? And once we realize the environment of the day, we can gain a lot of understanding as to what our roots really are. Was it from Judaism's traditions? Where do we get our practices? Do we get them from the Jewish teachings or do we get them directly from the Bible? Important distinction. We keep the biblical holy days. We keep the Sabbath. Did we get that from the Judaic ideas or did we get it straightly, straight out of the Old Testament? Do we keep those days the way they did? And if we were to look at how they keep them, we would realize that no, our traditions, our customs, our observances are quite different. So can it be said that we got what we do from Judaism? Oftentimes our friends and relatives will accuse us of being too Jewish. Well, that's formed from the idea that we're simply practicing a version of Judaism, and that's not the case at all. The modern Christian perspective assumes the latter when that's not the case at all. Is that the heritage or was there a fundamental change? We gotta ask, why did they kill Jesus Christ? The new covenant that he brought on scene was a sea change over what was understood in previous times. The question is, are we to embrace the ethnic family, the ethnic family of beliefs, or are, to, are we to look at being enjoined into the living family of God? There's a difference there. It's an important distinction. Judaism has been described by some as the world's strangest religion. And when you look into the Jewish religion carefully, you can begin to understand why a Christian, perhaps, might see it that way. I'm not saying that I agree with the statement. I'm just saying there are people who would look at it and recognize some aspects of Jewish practices, not so much beliefs, but practices, that are a little bit hard to understand. But I think we can understand them when we realize 
the climate or the soil in which that religion grew. The Jewish religion of Jesus' day is not the same as we find today. In fact, it's not monolithic. We would tend to think of Judaism as one great body of beliefs where all Jews believe basically the same thing. We should know better. That's not the case. There are people, and they're referred to in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, but there are people who say they are Jews and are not. And you have to wonder, why would people want to do that? They would say they're Jews when they're not. Now, this isn't talking so much about ethnicity. This is talking about something else. People want to embrace that kind of religion. But yet God says they're not. He knows, and they must know that he knows. So why would someone want to do that? It's in one of the earlier messages to the seven churches, and it's again in a later one. But there is a tendency of people who want to embrace aspects of the Jewish culture and religion, thinking that there's a benefit to doing that. If it's educational, if it helps people understand things, maybe that's fine. But what are we depending on it to do? It was after the WCG collapse, after its apostasy, that many people were looking for alternatives. And we can understand, based on practices, why there would be an attraction to messianic-type beliefs. Some people drew the conclusion, well, perfect or not, that's the next best thing. And we can understand that. However, we have to wonder what aspects of the Jewish religion are there that are valid and which ones are not. Now, we had a Bible study recently, not the last one, but the one before, where um, some major segments were read to us out of a book by um, Alfred Edersheim, a rather lengthy volume, but he's an expert on the, the early Christian religion as it relates to the Jewish climate. And he brought out something I had never realized. I suppose we knew this, but I don't know if we ever really thought about it. But in Jesus' day, there were different Jewish persuasions. It was not a monotheistic religion. Most of his ministry took place up north in Galilee. You'll notice in the lower part of the screen is Judea. That's where Jerusalem is. And then in between that is Samaria. And then to the north is Galilee. Most of Jesus' ministry took place in Galilee. Reason being, they were more receptive. Now, they were still a Jewish people. They still observed, you know, Jewish customs. But the religious climate there was very different. And he could say things there, he could do things there that would have been lethal had he tried it in Judea. Judea, of course, is where Jerusalem is, and that's where the temple was, and that's where the official priesthood was. But in between the two, we've got Samaria. We've heard a lot about the Samaritans, and Eric read us a passage that presents the Samaritans in a very unique way. Now, the Jewish people had absolute contempt for the Samaritans despised them, thought evil of them in every, every way possible. And we have to realize that was a long-standing situation, okay? The Samaritans formed 
from the divided monarchy. The capital was Samaria. King Jeroboam changed the customs, the laws, the calendars. They brought in their own priesthood and they had their own form of religion. Now we tend to think of Samaritans as perhaps secular or, or pagan. It wasn't the case at all. They were Jewish. They were very Jewish. Some things about them uh, it might help for us to understand. There is a section in my, my booklet on um, Passover observance. There's a whole chapter that talks about the Samaritans and their religion. I'll just read a few key points. And it's a National Geographic article from January of 1920. Someone went there and watched them, how they observed the Passover. And it, it was based, the, the title of the article was The Last Israelitish Rite of Passover. On page one it says, the Samaritans were remnants of a once numerous sect whose persistent continuation and literal performance of the Passover sacrifice have attracted the attention of students for three centuries. These people had been practicing the religion for centuries. They thought they were dying out. Actually, they, this, this, this sect, if we want to call it that, still exists to this day. On page 23 of that National Geographic article, it says, the Samaritan religion is closely akin to that of the Jews. The chief differences being that the cult of the former centers about Gerizim, which is right near Samaria, while that of the Jews centers around Zion. So it was a regional thing, more than a religious difference. Page 23, uh, again, of that uh, particular National Geographic article. In view of the similarity of their beliefs and practices, it seems strange that there exists and has always existed the fiercest animosity between Jew and Samaritan. But, is the, but it is the animosity, listen carefully to this, but it is the animosity that invariably exists between an original and a schism. Now think about our groups, okay? Is there any degree of animosity among our split off groups that left the quote unquote original. It just happens, it's natural I suppose. But think about it, that animosity has existed and has grown for over 900 years. It began with the divided monarchy. That's when it began. Well that was in, what, 922 BC, something like that. It was never resolved. Can you imagine that? 900 years of people resenting or disrespecting one another to that level. More on page 23 of that same National Geographic article. While the Jews have scattered all over, now this is an important point to consider. While the Jews have scattered all over the world since the captivities, and have absorbed much that is foreign, in many instances adapting their religious practices to their new environment, the Samaritans have, during the same lapse of time, lived in the land of their forefathers, among Semitic peoples akin to the Hebrews, and because of this fact, have handed down to the 20th century a glimpse of the old Israelitish church almost in its purity. A notable instance of the survival of an ancient religious ceremony is the celebration of the Passover sacrifice. Here's what that's saying, that while the Jews were taken captive and while they were in captivity, 
they picked up many of the customs and the beliefs and the habits of those people that held them captive. For more than a century in the case of the Northern Kingdom and for 70 years in the case of the, you know, the, case of the Southern Kingdom, they had all that time to absorb the customs and the beliefs of those around them. The Samaritans are claiming, no, we preserved the pure form. From the days of Eli, they claim. They've got their own Torah. They don't use the Jewish Torah. They have their own. And they claim it was written back in those years. It's very ancient. Perhaps the most ancient copy of the Torah that exists. And it exists to this day. But they were saying that they preserved the original Jewish religion, whereas the Judaic peoples have incorporated much from around them. And it's true. The Jewish religion is not pure. It wasn't pure in Jesus' day. There was these three different, distinct cultures. You had the Judean form. You have the Sumerian form in between them and the Galilean form. So when we understand Jesus' ministry, why it was important that he begin his ministry there, more so than in Judea, it changes the picture, but it tells us one important thing that Judaism, even of that day, was not consistent everywhere, much less so in this day and age. So those are some of the things that we need to think about. People who say they are Jews and are not, what particular form are they ascribing to? Let's go to that next slide, Les. This is the account that is found in the New Testament of where Jesus traveled. And as you can see, most of his ministry was accomplished up north in Galilee. Let's go to the blow up of that. You can see it a little better. Okay. Why? Because if he did what he did in the Jerusalem area, he would have been in trouble a lot sooner than he was. Now his disciples, his apostles, were from Galilee. That's where he found them. That's where he asked them to become his disciples. They were from Galilee. In Matthew 4.18, we can see that. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. His disciples were from Galilee, not from Judea. John 21, 2. John 21, 2. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Dynamis and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. They were all from Galilee. Now let's flip over to Acts chapter 2. And this is an interesting thing to, to think about. Acts chapter 2, around verse 7. And we're, we're familiar with this incident here. This was the occasion on the day of Pentecost when they were speaking in tongues to the public. And it says, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all of these which speak Galileans? Jesus' direct disciples were Galileans. 
Now you have to wonder how they knew that because they probably didn't know these individuals personally. How did they know they were Galileans? Curious thing, let me throw out an idea, see what you think. When I hear an Australian accent, I can tell right away they're Australian. Or a British accent, I can distinguish between the two. Or even a Canadian, okay? How they handle their vowels. You can tell when someone's a Canadian, no matter how hard they try not to not. It comes out, okay? I wonder if some of their Galilean accent didn't get preserved in the language that they were speaking, that's, how else would they know that they're all Galileans? But that tells us something important. Jesus' ministry focused in Galilee. He drew his disciples from Galilee. And he did so because the religious climate there was different than it was down in Judea. And it was even different in Samaria. Now, Samaria was the first place where Jesus announced publicly that he was the Messiah. He said that to the woman at the well. If he'd said that in Judea, we might have seen a very different reaction. But I'm sure the word spread around through her of his claim. But it was Samaria. Why? Because the culture allowed such a thing. So we need to understand that Judaism, and this is the point I want to make, that Judaism in the first century was not monolithic. The attitudes, the cultures, the belief system, the practices, and particularly the reaction of those people was very different depending on the region. So when we want to look at the question of what is Judaism, What do we say? Which one is the authentic form? Are they all the same? You wouldn't think so. Let's say somebody of an oriental religion. They wanted to keep their religion, but they wanted to also come a little closer to Christian religions. So they were going to borrow some Christian ideas and incorporate them into their oriental religion. Now, if you were talking to somebody who wanted to do that, what would you say to them? Wouldn't you think to say, which one? Because of the Christian religions, there are many different varieties. They're not all the same. So in that case, we might see it appropriate to ask the question, which one? Right? Logical? Well, how about the flip side? If someone is going to embrace Judaism or Jewish beliefs and practices, wouldn't we want to ask the question, which one? Which of the Jewish persuasions is the authentic one? Do we even know? Or further, does it even matter? You see, Jesus Christ came to introduce a whole new belief system. And it's not one that emerged from Judaism. That's the common idea. It's not. It did not emerge from it. It co coexisted with it. It coexisted alongside of it. It was thought at the time to be a sect of that particular belief system. But he brought a message that was unique and appropriate to the time that basically contradicted the Jewish belief system of the day to the extent that they saw a need to kill him. That's what happened. It's a fact. We know that. Why? Because his teachings were different than theirs. And so much so that they felt it necessary to do away with him. I want to read a few segments of this little pamphlet that we looked at um, briefly at our last Bible study. 
But there's some things about the Jewish religion that we don't tend to think about. One of the paragraphs here is Judaism's secret book, the Talmud. The Talmud is more germane to the Jewish religion than is the Old Testament. It says here, most Christians believe that the Jews follow only the Old Testament of the Holy Bible and reject the New Testament. The real truth is, their real Bible is the Talmud, the Jewish book. The Misbiach states that there is nothing superior to the Holy Talmud. Does that tell you something? The Talmud is made up of 63 books and is often printed in about 18 large volumes. Compare that to your Bible. The Talmud was written by rabbinical sages between the years 200 AD and 500 AD. So it wasn't even in existence in the first century. Now maybe many of the teachings were and they were later incorporated into the Talmud. But they didn't have it that early on. The article continues, while Christians follow the 12, what? 10 commandments, the Jews follow the 613 commandments of the Talmud. The big secret is just what are these commandments of the Jews? Another section here. What the Talmud rules about Christians. The Talmud holds that only Jews are true human beings and Gentiles are the goyim who are on the level with cattle and other animals. Where did that idea originate? That's what it says. The following are shocking but exact, quote, exact quotes from the various books of the Talmud. And he goes on to list a reference. I can't pronounce all of these names, but I will, uh, I'll just read what it says. It says, murdering goyim is like killing a wild animal. Now, goyim is their term for a, a Gentile. Another place, even the best of the Gentiles should be killed. Another place, a goy, quote unquote Gentile, who pries into the law, the Talmud, is guilty of death. Another place. To communicate anything to a goy about our religious relations would be equal to the killing of all Jews. <clears throat> For if the goyim know what we teach about them, they would kill us openly. These are some of the passages out of the Talmud. Another quote, a Jew may keep anything he finds which belongs to the Gentile. For he who returns lost property to a Gentile sins against the law by increasing the power of the transgressors of the law. It is praiseworthy, however, to return the lost property if it's done to honor the name of God. Namely, if by so doing, Christians will praise the Jew and look upon him, them as honorable people. This is not godly. This is not of God. But it gives us a glimpse into the attitude of the hardcore Jewish people towards Christians. Can we now understand why Jesus' ministry was largely way up north in Galilee. Because I'm sure that attitude, especially before the Christian era, was already hard line in that respect. This is what we need to understand. Now, in the story about that uh, uh, Eric read about the Good Samaritan, and we're very familiar with that, but in that story, it brings out an important aspect. It's the Samaritan who was presented as being 
loving, and compassionate. That characteristic was not found in those priests that walked by, even the Levite. They didn't have it. Now, does what I just read to you from that tract explain the thinking, the attitudes of the religious leadership back in the first century? Jesus was pointing out something, that there was a component that was missing. Compassion was missing in the Jewish faith. No matter how strict they were, no matter how devoted they were to worshiping God, there was something important missing. And that's why we see the emphasis on love that we do. That's what was missing. Jesus Christ came and introduced the concept of love. What did the religious ruler who asked Jesus the question, what was, what was he asking? What must I do? And what was his answer? The man gave it himself, to love God and to love your neighbor. That was the problem area. And we wonder how much so even today. Something we have to be careful about, something that we have to be cognizant of. Was Jesus' ministry leading people toward the Jewish religion or out of it? We tend to regard Judaism, again, as a pretty much monolithic religion. Let's look at Acts 6, verse 11. This is interesting. 6, 11. I think we know this, but do we think about it and, and realize the implications of it? Then they, which suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. This was Stephen. But go back to verse 9. There arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. What this is telling us, that even within the synagogue culture, there were people of different persuasions. They weren't all the same. Each had their own distinctive ideas and teachings that set them apart from one another. I'm not saying they weren't compatible. I'm just saying it shows that there were distinctions even within that one Judean community. And that's what we need to realize. When we say Judaism, what do we mean? We have to ask, like we would with the Protestants, we'd have to ask which version are we talking about? And if we don't know, and if we're going to embrace something, and we don't know, wouldn't it be profitable to look into it a little bit, after all? Because doing that, when people do that, it can insert a cultural division between like believers. And I think many of us have been exposed to such a thing, where some of our former persuasion, our former like believers years ago, who have gone off into other ideas, we may still love them, we may still fellowship with them, we may still believe pretty much as they do, but there's that element of division that can form is it of God? That's the important thing to realize. What are we doing? When we get away from the word, when we begin to incorporate cultural aspects that are not derived from the word, what happens? Now, there was a time when Jesus' disciples were observed. They were out and about somewhere. <clears throat> 
they stopped to eat lunch. And this big complaint came from the Judean contingent. Why do your disciples not wash their hands when they eat? I mean, not only were they to wash their hands, but they had to wash clear up to their elbows. You know, something like a medical doctor would do before an operation. They, they had to wash that thoroughly in order to remain righteous in their sight. Washing of cups and plates. All part of the ritual. How important was that? They thought it was essential. They were faulting Jesus' disciples because they weren't rigid in doing that. Now, maybe I'm sure they washed their hands on occasion. But to do so ritually before you even took a bite of food, you have to wonder, how important was that? Jesus made the point, not really. And that was a problem for a lot of those people. But he was changing the religion. Christianity did not grow out of Judaism. It came into being alongside of it. And people saw a lot of similarities at first and thought it was a, a sect of the Jewish religion. It's understandable that they would think that. But Jesus made a sea change. He introduced a whole new belief system, independent of it. And that's important to realize. And that's why we're here. And that's why we're not doing a lot of those ritualistic things that were so important in the Judean region in the first century. We need to recognize the flaws in Jewish theology, and you can't escape this, because that flaw led to and continues to this day to lead to the fundamental rejection of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Now there are elements within Judaism that do accept Jesus. We recognize them as messianics. It's a move in the right direction. But the Jewish theology, and it's evident in Scripture, in the New Testament even, that they were uncertain that there was any such thing as an afterlife. And I've heard this in the modern times. This life is all there is. Enjoy it. Get all you can because there's nothing after. There's people that believe that. They're indefinite as to the ultimate destiny or purpose of mankind. That's an important part to be missing. They're preoccupied with form, ceremony, ritual, more than to be aware of the purpose for which God made life in the first place. Preoccupied with form, not so much aware of the purpose. One persuasion, and we can read of that in Acts 23, verse 8, I'm sure you're familiar with it, one persuasion disallowed that there even was such a thing as a resurrection or the existence of a spirit being. Paul made a point of that. Let's go to, I'm right here anyway, let's go to it, Acts 23, 8. And this also tells us that the Jewish religion, even of that day, even within the Judaic persuasion, were not consistent in some important beliefs. And when he, verse 7, and when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees within their own fellowship sphere. <laughs> when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Back to the question, which 
manifestation of Judaism is authentic. Just from that one consideration, what do we say? That rejection of who was the Messiah necessitated that be it, that was be imposed upon them other blindnesses. Let's look at Matthew 23, verse 16. Matthew 23. And Jesus is here is laying out for them. And this is this is the dialogue that developed when he went to the Judean area. 23 verse 16. He says, Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whoso shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You fools and blind. For what's greater, the gold of the temple or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whoso swears by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, swears by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, swearing and by him that dwells therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by him that sits thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, ceremonial performance, and omitted the weightier matters of the law. This was the problem area. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. And he goes on and on this whole passage. But he's pointing out what was wrong with their belief system at the time. Do we understand that Christianity is not a form of Judaism? It didn't necessarily <clears throat> emerge out of it. The Christian religion, religion was made as a separate religion with a whole different focus, a whole different point of view. You see, the Messiah that they conceived of bore no resemblance to Jesus. And that rejection necessitated other blindness. Romans eleven seven. 7. What then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeks for. Their intention was right. Their objective was right. But they never got there. Israel has not obtained that which he seeks for, but the election has obtained it. And the rest were blinded. Very curious thing to say. Why would Jesus blind a certain ethnicity we've addressed that question in the past I'm going to just leave it out as there as a question at this point 2 Corinthians 3.14 2 more to reinforce that situation 2 Corinthians 3.14 I'm going to start in verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So there was another aspect of Jesus' ministry. They had the Old Testament. They were trying their best in, in most areas to comply with what it 
required of them. But they didn't get the full point. And that's the difference that Jesus injected into that belief system. But they still didn't get it. And they couldn't get it. Their preconceived ideas kept them from understanding. And it's only those who were awarded God's spirit who could begin to get the real point. So let's understand. Christianity is a distinct and separate religion. It is not a form of Judaism. The Jewish religion of that day, and especially even more so of our day with all of the Talmud and the Mishnah and all of that, were largely the decisions and the judgments of men. It's not biblical. Washing your hands before you take a bite of a sandwich. Good thing to do, but it's not the definite definition of righteousness or unrighteousness. It was thought to be. There's so many things that were invented by men. Let's look at Matthew 11:20. Matthew 11:20 I'm going long I realize so I'll cut it back. Matthew 11:20 This is important to realize. But there was an incident and that incident was amplified abnormally to make a point. What's the point? Verse 20. Oh, Mark 11:20 that would make a difference. I thought, Mark 11.20. I like the start in verse 17 just because it gives us a little more of the picture of this Judean persuasion. And he taught, saying unto them, and this is in Judea, this is in Jerusalem, is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. Talk about love. Talk about being able to repent. No, no. For they feared him. That was the right reason. It challenged their authority. They feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning they passed by and they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now, it was the previous day that he had cursed that fig tree. What is this illustration telling us? I mean, a tree doesn't die in one day. This is unusual. Peter, verse 21, calling to remembrance, says unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have Faith in God. For truly I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Now Jesus was illustrating his power, but he was explaining something important. The fig tree represented the belief system of the day. It could not produce fruits. And that was the realization of the previous morning. It talks in James, or I'm sorry, Jude 1, verse 12. Jude 1, 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds are they without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withers, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. 
Jesus was explaining to his disciples with this one example that the religious system represented by the fig tree was dead. It couldn't produce the kind of fruits that God wanted. That was the important lesson. He brought in a whole new religious system. And whatever similarities it may have had to the previous doesn't mean the previous gave birth to or gave legitimacy to the next. It was the other way around. We need to realize that. Luke 4, 18. Basically, Jesus announced what he was doing. Luke 4. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read, that's verse 16, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This prophecy is talking about a major change. And he was the instrument of that change. Captivity, restoration of sight, setting at liberty those that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Wasn't that already being done? Why would you announce that you were to do it if it wasn't already being done? So it's important to realize the, the Christian religion was not derived from that source. Let's conclude with James 1, verse 27. James 1, 27. This is important for us to realize. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. How does that compare with the previous religious system? Doesn't that say pretty much the same thing as that passage we just read from Isaiah? Proclaim liberty throughout the land. We can find that in Leviticus 23.10, Luke 4.18, Galatians 5, 1 and 13. Let's go to Galatians 5. And this alludes to something important. Because of that key word, liberty. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What do you suppose that's talking about? Verse 13 of Galatians 5. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of to the flesh, but by love serve one another. 
There's that missing component again. John, 1 John 3, 3. And I will conclude with this one. 1 John 3, 3. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Does the incorporation of unbiblical forms of religion exhibit that purity? That's what we need to consider. Any time we want to incorporate varying beliefs, we need to compare them with the word. We need to be aware that they're legitimate, that they matter, that they're important, and not just form. It's so easy to exhibit form without substance. We need to worship in spirit and in truth with a purity that is acceptable to God. You have received this information based upon the Word of God. Every additional topic concerning the truth, which originates in Scripture, builds understanding leading to salvation. We hope you will personally review the Scriptures cited in this presentation. God will teach you if you ask Him. Until next time, good day. Good day.